non-invasive method allows paralyzed people to partially regain the ability to move their arms. A new device that uses electrical impulses in combination with occupational therapy can partially restore the ability to move people paralyzed from the neck down. 43 of the 60 people who tested the solution showed improvement in hand strength and function. The method gives hope to people after spinal cord injury to change their lives. According to a study published in the journal Nature Medicine, after two months of therapy, 43 of 60 people participating in it regained the ability to use their arms and hands or improved their strength, precision, and control. I think this could be life-changing for most people with spinal cord injury, Chet Moritz of the University of Washington in Seattle, the study's lead author, said at a press conference. Scientists have made significant progress in recent years in helping people with spinal cord injuries. Researchers from the Federal Polytechnic University and the University Hospital of Lausanne are leading the way in this field. Last year, they put a man who had been paralyzed for over a decade back on his feet. All thanks to two implants that restored communication between the brain and the spinal cord. But Swiss researchers have several other similar stories. However, the methods they use require invasive surgery to implant devices near the spinal cord. The newly developed technique is non-invasive. The device called ArcX used in the therapy was developed by the Swiss medical technology company Onward. Its co-founder is Gregoire Courtin from the Federal Polytechnic University of Lausanne. ArcX delivers electrical current through electrodes placed on the skin of paralyzed patients near the site of spinal cord injury. Electrical stimulation helps nerves that remain intact after injury send signals and ultimately partially restore communication between the brain and the paralyzed part of the body. More than half of patients who suffer a spinal cord injury still have intact nerves, which can be used to improve their quality of life. Everyone thinks that after a spinal injury, all we want is to be able to walk again, said Melanie Reed, a British journalist for The Times and a research participant who was paralyzed when she fell off a horse 15 years ago. But if you have quadriplegia, the most important thing is to use your hands. There are no miracles when it comes to spinal injuries, but small benefits can be life-changing, she added. High-frequency electrical impulses amplify the impulses that the brain sends to the hands and arms via the nerves. In Reed's case, these signals were weakened by the damage to her spine. The journalist first underwent rehabilitation for two months. Then, for the next two months, rehabilitation was carried out using the ArcX device. After these actions, the woman regained the ability to grasp objects with her left hand, which, as Reed put it, was useless. Now Reed can use his hands to, for example, browse the contents of his smartphone. She said she was delighted with the device. My left hand is much stronger. I regained control. I can now use a tablet or smartphone with my left hand. I can unbuckle my seatbelt in the car and I can tie my hair into a ponytail again, which I couldn't do before, she said. The improvement achieved with the device, doctors point out, is small, but it can change the life of a paralyzed person through the impact it has on their daily routine and quality of life. The study included 65 patients from 14 countries with tetraplegia, i.e. for limb paralysis. The selected people had an accident between the ages of 1 and 34 years and had little or no improvement since then. Of the 60 people who completed the study, 43 showed improvement in arm and hand strength and function, and 52 reported improved quality of life. The benefits accumulate gradually over time when we combine spinal stimulation with intensive hand and arm therapy, 
so they are visible even after the stimulator is turned off, Moritz explained. Dr. Mariel Purcell, who led the Glasgow part of the study, said the treatment appeared to be safe and had some benefit for patients who suffered injuries more than a year ago. In post-injury patients undergoing standard rehabilitation, non-invasive spinal cord stimulation can bring enormous benefits. There is no other treatment like this, she admitted. This is not a cure, it's important to emphasize that, but we are at the beginning of a journey that will make recovery from spinal injury a real possibility, Kurtine said. Now the researchers plan to investigate whether their device can help restore or improve other functions, such as walking. The team is also seeking regulatory approval to use the system to treat patients in the U.S. Solving the mystery of the swollen planet Data from the Webb telescope helped. The exoplanet WASP-107b is about the size of Jupiter, but only one-tenth its mass, making it one of the lowest density planets. This is why it is called the Candy Floss Planet. Since its discovery, researchers have wondered how such a world could have arisen. It seems that astronomers have finally managed to solve the mystery, and this was made possible by observing what is happening inside the planet. WASP-107b is a large, swollen planet that was discovered in 2017. It orbits a small, bright star in the constellation Virgo, slightly smaller and slightly less massive than our Sunday. It is about the size of Jupiter, but has a much smaller mass, reaching only one-tenth its mass, making it one of the lowest density planets. This world is located about 200 light-years from Earth and orbits its star in less than six days. While these types of fluffy planets are not uncommon, most of them are hotter and more massive, and therefore their history is easier to explain. But WASP-107b eluded scientists. Its parameters challenged our theories of planet formation. In two recent publications in the journal Nature, two independent teams of scientists used data collected by the James Webb Space Telescope JWST, to determine the true nature of very low-density exoplanets. Since WASP-107b was discovered, astronomers have wondered how this world formed. Over the course of several years, various scenarios were created. One of them suggested that this world had a small core and a huge atmosphere. This would certainly explain the observations, although it was unclear how such a small, rocky structure could accumulate such a large envelope of gas. Based on the radius, mass, age, and internal temperature, we believed that WASP-107b had a very small, rocky core surrounded by a huge mass of hydrogen and helium, admitted Louis Felbanks from Arizona State University, ASU, lead author of one of the papers in Nature. But we had a hard time understanding how such a small core could accumulate so much gas and then keep from fully transforming into a Jupiter mass planet, he added. In contrast, if WASP-107b had a larger core, the atmosphere should have shrunk as the planet cooled over time. Without a heat source to re-expand the gas, the planet should be smaller. WASP-107b is much closer to its star than Mercury is from the Sunday. The two objects are only one-seventh the distance between Mercury and the Sun, but WASP-107b's host star is cooler than the Sunday. Unlike other cotton candy worlds, WASP-107b does not receive enough light to warm up and then expand the atmosphere. Only the data collected by JWST allowed us to solve the mystery. Scientists recorded the transit of the planet against the background of its host star. Some of the light from the star is filtered by the planet's atmosphere. 
By observing this light, JWST was able to determine some of the components of its atmosphere. As David Singh of Johns Hopkins University, JHU, lead author of a parallel study published in Nature, noted, WASP-107b is cooler than similar swollen worlds, and this makes it possible to detect methane and other compounds that could provide information on the composition of the atmosphere and its dynamics. This information could not be obtained from a hotter planet. And surprisingly, it turned out that there is a thousand times less methane on WASP-107b than expected. Data collected by the James Webb Space Telescope, combined with previous observations from the Hubble Space Telescope, allowed not only the detection but also the measurement of many molecules, including water vapor, methane, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, and ammonia. Scientists were primarily interested in the small amount of methane. Hot gas from deep inside the planet must mix vigorously with cooler layers above. Methane is unstable at high temperatures. The fact that we detected so little of it even though we found other carbon-containing molecules tells us that the planet's interior must be much hotter than we thought, Singh explained. Scientists believe the source of WASP-107b's internal heat is most likely tidal heating caused by the planet's slightly elliptical orbit. As the distance between the star and the planet constantly changes, the gravitational pull also changes. This process causes the planet's structure to continually expand and contract, heating it up. Astronomers had previously suggested that tidal heating might be the cause of WASP-107b's swelling, but until the results from the Webb telescope emerged, there was no evidence of this. But it is not everything. Once scientists determined that the planet had enough internal heat to thoroughly mix its atmosphere, they realized that the data they collected could also provide a new way to estimate the size of an exoplanet's core. If we know how much energy is on the planet and we know how much of the planet is made up of heavier elements such as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur compared to the amount of hydrogen and helium, we can calculate how much mass must be in the core explained Daniel Thorngren from JHU. Further analysis showed that the core of WASP-107b is at least twice as massive as originally estimated which makes more sense in terms of how planets form.